Hi friends, so today we're going to be doing my May wrap up as well as my April wrap up. Because I only read two books in April and then I read four books in May, so you know, it's not, it's not a lot of reading over the past two months. We're going to talk about the books that I read in April first, and both of these were on the shortlist for the Women's Prize. I'm trying to read the full shortlist. I tried to read as much of the shortlist as I could have in May, and I ended up reading none. <laughs> I read like half of two of the books, but I didn't finish them. So the only two that I finished thus far are still the two that I read in April, which both of them I talked about in more detail in another video so you could go check that out. But just to give you a quick summary of what I read, uh, the first is The Bread the Devil Need by Lisa Allen Agostini. This is a novel set right here in Trinidad and Tobago and it's about a woman named Alethea who is currently in an abusive relationship and she has had a history of abuse with her mother, her uncle, and various of her previous lovers. And so this is something that she's sort of conceded to as a normal thing or something that she just has to like accept and deal with as part of her life. And this is a story about her slowly unraveling herself from that. There's also a lot of intrigue in this book too because she has a bit of a questionable and mysterious family history. Um, there's a lot of crazy things going on in this book and it was quite an engaging read. I really, really loved it. One of my favorite aspects about this book is that it's written in Trinidadian Creole. That's a very tricky thing to do even for authors who are from the Caribbean and sometimes it ends up coming across as a bit contrived, like the author is trying really hard to sound authentic. But Lisa Allen Agostini does it in a way that feels so organic and real. It feels like I'm listening to a real Trinidadian woman tell her story. I did have some problems with the ending. I felt like things wrapped up a bit too nicely, but then I actually ended up having a conversation with the author about it because we're actually in the same degree program and I didn't know this at our local university, so we ended up talking about it. I met her online, of course. So that was great because that ended up being resolved for me. This book was just absolutely fantastic. I, I give it four and a half stars and I could not recommend it enough. The next book that I read for the Women's Prize was The Sentence by Louise Erdridge and this one takes place in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It follows a woman named Tookie who is of Native American descent and she works at a local independent bookstore that is also selling Native American books that specializes in Native American literature. The central conflict of the story though is a haunting. Essentially one of the most annoying customers, this uh, white lady named Flora, who claimed to have Native American heritage ends up dying and her ghost ends up haunting the store and somewhat terrorizes Tookie. It's not like a horror or paranormal story but it does have some intense uh, spooky moments. I wouldn't say spooky. Unsettling. Yeah, let's call it that. Flora's daughter ends up giving Louise the book that she was reading when she died. She literally died while reading the book and the bookmark and everything was in the same exact place. Tookie believes that there was a particular sentence in the book that killed Flora. She genuinely believed that the book is sentient and it killed Flora. And so she takes the book home and the book also ends up tormenting her in a way. So really interesting concept. Really this is a story about Native American history, it's a story about literature, and it's also a story about the pandemic. The book starts off in the late 2010s, right, so it ends up bleeding into 2020 and the pandemic happens, which is interesting because this is the first book that I've ever read that addresses the pandemic, and when it rains it pours because the next book I'll be talking about also ends up doing that. And then because it's set in Minneapolis, it ends up talking about the murder of George Floyd and the protests that erupted after that. And even though the start of the pandemic and the protests in America were two years ago, uh, honestly it still feels like we're in 2020. <laughs> the whole pandemic feels like 2020. So it's interesting because this book feels current in a way, in a way that almost feels strange because books often do not feel that current. They're published usually a year or two after they've been properly written. And that is probably the case for this book, but because like the things in it still feel so recent, it feels like a fresh story in a way that I've never quite experienced before. And I really enjoyed that. It was just a wonderful story with so many different interesting layers to it. And I loved it. I found it to be fascinating and enthralling. I definitely need to read some more literature. I give this five stars. So the next book that ends up addressing pandemics is Emily St. John Mandel's new book called Sea of Tranquility. She's most known for Station Eleven, a book that I actually wanted to read. And I went to the store and I saw Station Eleven. I was like, ooh, maybe Maybe it's time for me to finally read that. Then I saw this sitting next to it. I was like, oh yeah, she has a new book. I read the blurb and I was like, okay, we're taking the new book. This is definitely one of the most bizarre and trippy reads that I've ever read in a really long time. It's a genre bending book that touches contemporary and literary fiction, but also historical fiction and science fiction, <laughs> futuristic science fiction. It's set in about five or six different timelines, honestly more timelines, but the main ones are like 1912, 2020, 2020, 
203 and 2401. So the book literally takes place within the span of 500 years. It's absurdly fascinating. It's also partially set like on the moon, <laughs> which was fascinating because in the later timelines, humans have apparently figured out how to colonize the moon. All of the characters in each of the timelines are not connected to each other in any familial or historical way other than they all go through and experience the same strange phenomena which is they are walking somewhere and then everything turns dark and they see a forest and they hear a violin and they hear a hydraulic spaceship sound oh the poor character from 1912 when he heard that sound he was like mom what is that he called it a whoosh everybody else called it hydraulics <laughs> And he called it a whoosh because he's from 1912. But that's not the only bizarre thing. After that happens to the characters, they end up meeting the same man. They all end up meeting the same man who seems to be or appears to be time traveling. That's all I'll tell you for now because I don't want to spoil it too much. All I can say is that I really, really love this book. I found it so engaging, such a fascinating and different story. What was so interesting to me though was how in the midst of all of the chaos and trippiness that this book is, it still seemed so real and calm and down to earth. The plot is chaotic, but the story is calm. As speculative and absurd as it was, it just felt so utterly real. I can't describe it better than the New Yorker in the back. And they said, uh, Mendel's gift is to weave realism out of extremity. She plants her flag where the ordinary and the astonishing meet. And that is the perfect summary for this book. If you're a stickler for will building, you probably won't really appreciate this story because it's really not about like the sci-fi elements. That's definitely a huge part of the story itself. But it's really more so about the concept than it is like the world so don't go into this expecting like a huge like detailed description of like the moon colonies and space and spaceships and all that kind of stuff no the book is very humble and minimalistic in its sci-fi elements and in a way i appreciated that i was going to give this book four stars because there was one character who i felt like her storyline was not wrapped up properly but then i realized when i was doing some digging after that this book is a companion to one of her previous novels glass hotel wherein that character's story is told so what i thought was a flaw of the novel isn't it's literally that Emily St. John Mendel didn't really care to talk much about that character because there's a whole book about her. But anyways, once I got that out of the way, there was no reason for me not to give this book the five stars that I felt like it deserved. The next book that I read in May was Black Cake by Shamine Wilkerson. This is a story about a woman named Eleanor who passed away and it focuses on her two children, Byron and Benny, who don't like each other and haven't been talking for a very long time. They have to essentially sit down and listen to this tape recording that their mother left for them where she basically spills all of the family's secrets and tea and history. So the mother Eleanor was originally from an unnamed Caribbean island, Jamaica. So she's basically telling her two American children the story of what happened there, which centers around this mysterious girl named Coventina Lynn Cook who drowned. They don't know who Coventina is, what her connection to her family is, but she holds all the secrets to their past. I really love this book. I honestly would not have read it had it not been a pick for Bashman Book Club, which is a Caribbean book club that I host with Paige and Donnell. This was our book for me. It was so good. It was such a layered story that had so many different cool and interesting aspects to it. The whole family history, all of the family secrets. It's so, it was a delectable read. There were some aspects of it that I found to be a little bit like, on the nose, predictable, unbelievable. You do have to kind of suspend your belief when you're reading this and not take it too seriously. But once you put those things aside, it's still a really good story. If you've already read the book or when you have read it, I definitely recommend that you watch our Bashman Book Club live show feed because we go into more detail there. We had some really interesting discussions like the symbolism of black cake in the story. Black cake is a dessert in the Caribbean that is made from different ingredients and that has different historical influences. And and it ends up being a really interesting allegory for Caribbean culture and Caribbean people itself. Because unless you are indigenous to the Caribbean, everything that you are and everything that you've grown up with is an amalgamation of things that come from elsewhere. We're all descendants of immigrants from Asia and Africa and Europe. And a lot of our culture, our language, our music are based on those influences as well. The history of colonialism and settlement, forced migration, mixing and integration is what makes Caribbean culture today. And black cake ends up being a really interesting 
uh, analogy for that. The Desert, I think, also played another huge role in this story, which was the fact that it's something that allowed the characters to connect with Jama the unnamed Caribbean island of origin. <laughs> Considering, you know, that this is a story about loss and abandonment and separation, right? And that's something that a lot of people in diasporas across the world often feel. And food becomes a way to connect with that homeland. Food becomes the only thing that might remain consistent in many people's lives as they migrate across the world. As for the whole unnamed island thing, it was really interesting because I didn't realize that this book was not set explicitly in Jamaica. I read this entire book swearing to God that I saw the word Jamaica in it. <laughs> I literally thought that the characters at some point said that they were from Jamaica, but they did not. <laughs> say that at all. They just call it the island. Funny because this book is also partially set in Italy and the UK and America and those places are explicitly named. We did have a whole conversation about that as well in the live show so you should watch the live show. But overall I highly recommend it. It was really good. Um, I'm tempted to give this three and a half stars like objectively but subjectively I enjoyed it so much and I think I just rounded off to four stars. The next two books I don't want to spend too long on because I'm going to be doing other videos on them. So the first one is Avatar The Last Airbender The Promise. I recently watched Avatar and Legend of Korra. Really really love those shows and now I want to read all of the books that are canon. This is the first omnibus in uh, the comic series that continues Avatar The Last Airbender. So it picks up right where we left off and Team Avatar is now having to face a new conundrum where they have to decide whether the fire colonies that exist in the Earth Kingdoms deserve to stay or whether they should go back to the Fire Nation. It ends up really being an interesting political exploration of settlement, right? Like, you know, these are settler colonies living on indigenous land, but they've been there for so many generations. Is it really ethical to get rid of them. And so that's a really interesting question that um, was posed throughout the book and I found that to be fascinating. I mean I'll talk more about that and its implications and whatnot in the video but I thought it was a really fascinating road for the uh, creators to go down. I definitely recommend it if you watch the show. The art is so spot on. It feels like you're just watching season four of Avatar. It's it's so good. I didn't like love love it but the thing about comics for me is that I need to read like a full series for me to really appreciate the full story. So it's difficult for me to give books like this five stars so I'll just give this a solid four stars. And then the last book I have to talk about is one that I listened to completely on audio and it's called Blame It on Bianca Del Rio. You heard that sigh. This is for another project that I'm doing where I'm reading books by famous drag queens. Um, I love Bianca Del Rio, don't get me wrong, but this book was a, it was a bit much for me. It's essentially her answering fan letters and giving them advice. If you know Bianca Del Rio, <laughs> You'd know that her advice isn't really advice. The thing about Bianca that you have to understand is that she is an insult comic and she's very raunchy and very politically incorrect. Which I don't usually mind small doses of, but this book was a little bit more than a dose for me. It was five hours of her berating every creed and race. <laughs> Which again, like I can handle a little bit of politically incorrect humor, but I think that Bianca went very far with a lot of the things that she was saying and there were definitely things that I laughed at and aspects of it that I enjoyed but then there were parts that were just so absurd and so over the top that I felt like it really cheapened this style of comedy. I ended up giving it two stars. <laughs> but yes that's everything that I read in April and me. In the comments down below I'd love to know if you've read any of these books and if you have any thoughts on them. But thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely lovely day and until next time inshallah keep reading.